Hi everyone. Good day to you, wherever you are. And I welcome you to the finest music drama channel. Sharing the love of finest literature. Just lie down on an easy chair. Throw your cares off your mind. Think of nothing but the temperature of your drink. I hope you will enjoy today's dramatization. Your comments are much appreciated. Please support the love of finest literature by subscribing and sharing the channel with friends to get updated on future releases. Now, in his classic novel of revenge and retribution, Alexandre Dumas brought to life the horrors of an island prison in the Bay of Marseille, a prison in which two jailers are preparing for a burial at sea. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Dramatized for radio in seven episodes by Barry Campbell Part 4 The House at Otoy Starring Andrew Sachs as Edmond Dantes, Geoffrey Matthews as Baron Danglars, Steve Hodson as Le Comte de Morcerf, Nigel Anthony as de Villefort, and Melinda Walker as La Comtesse de Morcerf. While visiting Rome in February 1838, the Vicomte de Morcerf was kidnapped and held for ransom by bandits. His friend, Franz d'Epinay, immediately sought the help of the mysterious Count of Monte Cristo, with the result that Albert was set free. Albert, out of gratitude, has promised to introduce the Count into Parisian society. Good morning, Lucien. Your punctuality alarms me. Has the government resigned? No, my dear Albert. We are always tottering, but we never fall. <laughs> but tell me, what is the purpose of a party at such an ungodly hour? I would hardly call ten in the morning ungodly. But the purpose is to amuse you by introducing you to a new acquaintance, a man who comes from the end of the world. The devil! <laughs> but tell me, what news do you bring me this morning? Baron Danglars made a speech in the Chamber of Deputies. And the gossips of Paris speak of a marriage between yourself and his daughter, Mademoiselle Eugénie, <sighs> and of a settlement in the region of 80,000 francs. While your friend Beauchamp, the editor, says this marriage will never take place, the king has made Danglars a baron, but he cannot make him a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> All the same, 80,000 is a nice little sum. <laughs> Monsieur de Chateau Renaud, Monsieur Maximilien Morel. My dear Renaud. Albert, good morning. Let me introduce you to Monsieur Maximilien Morel, Captain of Spahi, my friend and preserver, the man who saved my life at Constantine. Welcome, sir. You are Renaud's friend, be our friend also. But how did you save Renaud's life? Oh, it is not worth speaking of. Our friend exaggerates. Exaggerates? Oh. 
Now tell me, what time do we eat breakfast down there? At half past ten, for I also expect someone who saved my life. Oh, where does he come from? I do not know. When I invited him three months ago, he was in Rome. Since then, who can tell? It was he who rescued me when I was kidnapped there by bandits. He paid your ransom. He said two words to Vampa, the chief, and I was free. <gasps> What is the name of this paragon? He is the Count of Monte Cristo. <laughs> there is no Count of Monte Cristo. I had never heard of him. Monte Cristo is a small island in the Mediterranean, is it not? And he is the lord and master of this island. Ah, he is rich then. He must have a cave filled with the wealth of the Indians. <laughs> <laughs> Are you laughing at us, Albert? I have heard something of this from an old sailor named Penelon. Ah, thank you, Monsieur Morel, for coming to my aid. Otherwise, you others might think me mad. <laughs> Well, Albert, it is half past ten and no sign of your friend. Confess you have dreamed all this and let us sit down to our breakfast. His Excellency, the Count of Monte Cristo. My dear Count, welcome to Paris. Punctuality is the politeness of kings. Alas, it is not the same with travellers. However, I hope you will excuse the two or three seconds I am behindhand. Five hundred leagues are not to be accomplished without some trouble. <laughs> Count, allow me to present to you Le Comte de Chateau de Renault, ah. Monsieur, uh, Monsieur Lucien de Bray, Enchanted. Count, and Monsieur Maximilien Morel, Captain of Spahi. Uh, Morel, did you say? Uh, that, that, that is a handsome uniform. And Monsieur. beneath it beats one of the bravest and noblest hearts in the whole army. I'm sure that's true. Come, gentlemen. Breakfast is ready. <laughs> what? You have not eaten for 24 hours? No, no, the journey was long. And you didn't eat in your carriage? No, I slept, as I generally do when I'm weary. But you can sleep where and when you please. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I have a recipe for it. An infallible one. I make no secret of it. It is a mixture of opium and hatchies. You always carry this drug about with you? No, always. I will show you. I keep it in this. Oh, oh. But, but this pillbox, it is the largest emerald I have ever seen. It is magnificent. Yes, I had three. One I gave to the Grand Seigneur, who mounted it in his sabre. Another to our Holy Father, the Pope. And the third, you see, I had hollowed out to make this pillbox. But what, may one ask, did these two sovereigns give you in exchange for these magnificent presents? Ah, well, the Grand Seigneur, the liberty of a young woman, and the Pope, the life of a man. Was that the man Peppino you saved from the guillotine in Rome? Yes, perhaps. <laughs> but, my dear Morself, when we last met three months ago, I recollect that you mentioned a forthcoming marriage. Huh? May I now congratulate you? The affair has still not been finalised. That means it has already been decided. <laughs> <laughs> not so. My father is most anxious about it. However, I hope before too long to introduce you, if not to my wife, at least to my intended, Mademoiselle Eugenie Donglas. Oh, really? Is she not the daughter of the banker, Baron Donglas? Do you know the Baron? I shall probably soon make his acquaintance, for I have a credit opened with him by the house of Thompson and French. Well, do you know this house, monsieur? They are my bankers. Oh, Count, you could assist me, perhaps, with some researches. Oh? This house did my family a great service. Indeed, they saved my father's life, but they have always denied doing so. Uh, well, I shall be only too glad to assist you. <laughs> but we have wandered from the subject. We were speaking earlier of a suitable accommodation for the Count. Mm. I will venture to offer him apartments that my sister, Julie, inhabited. You have a sister? Yes, a most excellent sister. Married? Yes, and as happy as can be. Oh, that is good. Well, gentlemen, as to my accommodation, since I determined to have a house to myself, I sent on my steward, and he ought by this time to have bought a house for me and furnished it, according to my taste. <gasps> and you have not seen it yet? Well, how could I? I came directly here. <laughs> but by the time I leave you, my coachman will have the address. Incredible. Oh, my dear Albert, look at the time. I must go. Your guest is charming, but alas, I must return to the ministry. I'm afraid that I must go also. Are you coming, Morel? Well, directly I have given my card to the Count of Monte Cristo. You will pay us a visit, I hope. Oh, be sure I shall not fail to do so. <laughs> Bravo, Albert, a most delightful party. Come then, gentlemen, let me show you out. And then, my dear Count, yes. I should like to present my parents to you. Count, I have the honour of presenting to you my father, Le Comte Fernand de Morcerf. You're most welcome, Monte Cristo. You have rendered my house a magnificent service in preserving its only heir. Monsieur, 
My wife will join us shortly. It is a great honour, sir, on my first day in Paris, to be brought into contact with a man whose merit equals his reputation. Ah, I have left the service now, sir. I have hung up my sword and cast myself into politics. Albert, how nice. I wish to... Mother, I should... Why, what is the matter? Are you unwell, Mercedes? Does the heat affect you? No. It is nothing. But I feel some emotion on seeing for the first time the man who rescued my son in Rome. Oh, monsieur, I owe you my son's life. And for that, I bless you. Madame, it was a simple deed of humanity. It is very fortunate for my son that he found such a friend. And I thank God that things are thus. Will you do us the honour of passing the rest of the day with us, monsieur? Uh, uh, f forgive me, madame, but uh, I'm only just arrived in Paris. My, my domestic arrangements... Then we not... shall have this pleasure another time. You promise that? Madame, now, if you will excuse me... I will not detain you, monsieur. I would not have our gratitude become indiscreet or importunate. I will accompany you to your carriage, Monte Cristo. I am due to speak in the chamber at three. Adieu, then. And uh, a thousand thanks for, for your kindness. Oh. Mother, are you unwell? You looked so pale when you entered the room that I was worried. Oh. Was I pale, Albert? It was the heat. Nothing more. Oh. Do you think the Count is really what he appears to be? And what does he appear to be, Mother? Why, a man of high distinction. Tell me, what do you suppose the Count's age to be? Why, uh, 35 or 36, I suppose. So young. Oh, it is impossible. Do you like him? Yes, he pleases me. In spite of Franz d'Epinay, who tries to convince me that the Count is a being returned from another world. Oh, he said that. Oh, Albert, be careful. Welcome to Paris, Count, and to your new house. Yes, yes, thank you, Bertuccio. Everything has been prepared for your arrival as you ordered. Good. And uh, this is the notary, Count. Mm. You are empowered to sell the country house that I wish to purchase? I am, sir. No, no, d don't go, Bertuccio. I may need you. Excellency. Now to business. Is the deed of sale ready? I have it here. Very well. And where is this house? What? <laughs> you do not know where the house is situated? How should I know it? I only arrived in Paris this morning. This is my first visit. Ah, I understand. Well, the house is at Auteuil. Auteuil? Mm -hmm. And where is this Auteuil? Close by here, monsieur, in the heart of the Bois de Boulogne. But your excellency already has this house that I obtained for you. Yes, that is true, but I was tempted by an advertisement in one of the papers, so I will have two houses. <laughs> the deed, if you please. Thank you. Um, there, it is signed. Now, Bertuccio, see that this gentleman is given 55,000 francs. Have you the key, sir? The concierge who takes care of the house has them. Very well. Bertuccio, have my carriage ready in half an hour. Uh, this way, monsieur. Good day, Count. Your Excellency's carriage is at the door, as you ordered. Now, uh, Bertuccio, you have travelled in France, I believe. Well, in some parts of France, yes. You know the environs of Paris, then? Well, that is... Uh... No? Oh, that is unfortunate, for I, I wish now to visit my new property, and I thought you could show me the way. However... To Otoy. Me go to Otoy. Oh, why not? You wish me to accompany you? Oh, certainly. What is the matter with you today? Come, we have wasted enough time. Let us go. Well... What is it? What do you want? Your new master is here. The house is sold, then? And this gentleman is coming to live here? Yes, my friend. And I will give you no cause to regret the departure of your old master. Oh, monsieur, I shall not have much cause to regret him. Why, it must be five years since he was last here. Uh, but come in, sir, please. Mm. Mm. Tell me, what was the name of your old master? The Marquis de Saint-Méron. Oh, yes. An old gentleman, a staunch follower of the Bourbons. 
He had an only daughter who married a Monsieur de Villefort. She died... Uh, Monsieur de Villefort? Hmm. Uh, give me a light. I wish to see the house. Uh, shall I accompany you, sir? No, my servant will light the way. Uh, Bertuccio, come. Tolerably large ground floor. While here upstairs... Hmm. Oh. Where does this little staircase lead to? Into the garden, Excellency. Really? How do you know that? Oh, it ought to do so, at least I... Ah, let us see. Lead on. I... What is the matter, man? Monsieur, it is impossible. I cannot go on. Why, what does this mean? Monsieur... Oh, come, lead on. Let us visit this mysterious garden. You're not afraid of ghosts with me here, I hope? No, Excellency, but... Ah, you were quite right, Bertuccio. It did lead to the garden. Move, monsieur, please. You are exactly on the spot. The spot? Where he fell. My dear Bertuccio, control yourself. Oh, Excellency. Why are you so agitated? Oh, sir, it was a vengeance, nothing more. A vengeance? Explain yourself. Against Monsieur de Villefort. You are standing on the very spot where he fell. And just there is the grave where he had just buried his child. The man was a villain. This begins to interest me. Bertuccio, I think it is time you told me your story. Let us sit down here. Excellency, where shall I begin? At the beginning. Very well. It was in 1815. Mm -hmm. I had an elder brother whom I loved dearly. In that year, he was assassinated at Nîmes. I did everything in my power to discover his murderers, but no one dared tell me their names. Finally, I went to the public prosecutor to demand justice, and since my brother was a lieutenant in the army, a small pension for his widow. And the prosecutor was... De Villefort. Ah. He came from Marseille, where he had been deputy. I see. Did he help you? <sighs> Excellency, the man was made of stone. He would not listen to me. Mm. Then he told me that if I did not leave, he would have me removed by force. In my anger, I declared a vendetta against him. I swore that I would kill him. Mm. Go on. Well, I began to watch his every move. For three months, I followed him everywhere. At length, I discovered that he went mysteriously to Otoy, to this very house, which was then led to a pretty young widow. She was 18 at the time. I saw her here in this very garden. Did you ever discover her name? No, Excellency. Well, one night, I hid uh, by that wall over there. On the stroke of midnight, De Villefort appeared. He carried a small box some two foot long, which he buried. I assumed it contained valuables. Mm -hmm. As he was finishing, I rushed on him. I am Giovanni Bertuccio, I cried. Thy death for my brothers, your treasure for his widow, and I plunged my knife into his breast. Then in a moment I had dug up the box and fled. I see. And what was in this mysterious box? A newborn baby, wrapped in fine linen cloth and still alive. <sighs> what did you do? I took it to my sister in Italy, so that she could bring it up as her own son. God forgive me. And was the child de Villefort? I suppose it must have been. Yes. Continue. After my attack on de Villefort, I went back to my old trade as a smuggler. So what of the child? My sister brought it up. It was a lovely baby with big blue eyes. Uh, but God was to make that child the instrument of our punishment. Benedetto. That was his name. Grew to be a monster. By the time he was eleven, he was mixing with the worst characters in the town. Then, one night, some years later, he came home with three companions, ruffians, all of them. They demanded money from my poor sister. Of course, she had none to give them. So they tortured her until she died. Then they ransacked her house and left. I have not seen or heard of Benedetto since. Ah, those Villefors are an accursed race. Yes, truly they are. You have acted properly by telling me. I come, Bertuccio. Let us go in. The air grows cold. Excellency. Good morning, sir. I have the honour of addressing the Count of Monte Cristo, I presume. And I of speaking to Baron Danglars. 
a Chevalier of the Legion of Honour and member of the Chamber of Deputies. <laughs> uh, permit me to inform you that I have received a letter of advice from the banking house of Thompson and French. Ah, I'm glad to hear it. <clears throat> Therefore, my, my checks will be duly honoured. There is one slight difficulty. The letter gives the Count of Monte Cristo unlimited credit on our house. Yes. Now, what is there that requires explaining in that simple fact? Merely the word unlimited. Oh. Is the word not known in France? <laughs> or is it possible that Thompson and French are not looked upon as safe and solvent bankers? They are bankers of the highest repute. It was not of their solvency I spoke, but of the word unlimited. I see. Whereas Thompson and French set no bounds to their engagements, the House of Danglars has its limits. <laughs> Monsieur, the amount of my capital has never yet been questioned. It seems, then, that I must be the first to do so. By what right, sir? By right of the objections you have raised, which certainly imply considerable distrust of me. Well, sir, I will endeavour to make myself understood by requesting you to inform me what sum you propose to draw upon me. Why, truly, my reason for desiring an unlimited credit was precisely because I did not know how much money I might expend. Let me beg you not to hesitate in naming your wishes. You will then be convinced that the resources of the House of Danglars are still equal to meeting the largest demands. <laughs> And were you even to require a million? I... Uh, I beg your pardon. I observed that, should you be hard-pressed, the concern of which I am the head would not scruple to accommodate you to the amount of a million francs. A million? Yes. And what use can you possibly suppose so pitiful a sum would be to me? Pitiful? My dear sir, if a trifle like that could satisfy me, I should never have given myself the trouble of opening an account. Uh, a million? Excuse my smiling when you speak of a sum that I am in the habit of carrying in my pocketbook. <laughs> oh, come. Confess honestly that you have not perfect confidence in the house of Thompson and French. Well, of course. I... Now, now, sir, you have but to say the word, and I will spare you all uneasiness and alarm on the subject by presenting my letters of credit elsewhere, for yes. I have other letters of unlimited credit. See, here, here. Yes. Hmm? Yeah. Right. But uh, these letters represent untold wealth. You must pardon me for confessing the most extreme astonishment. Oh, it is not for such trifling sums as these to startle or astonish the banking house of Danglars, surely. <laughs> hmm. Um, yes, well, then if all is agreed between us, uh, I, I will thank you to send me a supply of money tomorrow. Oh, uh, by all means. How much do you require? Well, uh, shall we say six million? Hmm? Half in gold? The other half in banknotes? Six, six million? Why? Certainly, whatever you please. Good. And uh, should I need more, I will, of course, draw upon you. The money and the gold will be delivered by ten tomorrow. Good. <laughs> uh, but now, if it is agreeable to you, I shall do myself the honour of introducing you to my wife, who is, I understand, at the moment entertaining visitors. Uh, have you any objection to meeting them, or do you wish to remain incognito? No, I shall be delighted to meet the Baroness and her friends. Oh, excellent. I must confess to you, my dear Count... <laughs> that I have hitherto imagined myself acquainted with the degree of fortune possessed by all the rich individuals of Europe. <laughs> Wealth such as yours has been wholly unknown to me. Uh, may I presume to ask whether you have long possessed it? Rest assured, you will be better informed about me before long, my dear Baron. Oh, yes. My dear... Give me leave to present to you the Count of Monte Cristo, who has been warmly recommended to me by my correspondence in Rome. Ah. The Count has come to take up his abode in our fine capital for one year, during which brief period he proposes to spend six million francs. <laughs> Charmed, Baroness. Count. And this, my dear Count, is Monsieur Lucien de Bray, Private Secretary to the Minister of the Interior. Count? Ah, yes. I am fortunate in having already made the acquaintance of Monsieur de Bray at the house of uh, Monsieur Albert de Morcerf. Ah, you are acquainted with the young Vicomte Albert, are you? Oh, yes. We were together a great deal during the carnival at Rome. Of course. <laughs> I heard some talk of bandits, I remember. Ah. You have selected a most unfavourable moment for your visit to Paris, Count. Oh? It is a horrible place in the summer. Parties, balls, fete, everything is over. The only amusements left us are the indifferent horse races held in the Champ de Mars. 
Do you propose entering horses at these races, Count? My present intentions are to do whatever will make my time in Paris most agreeable to myself and others. Excuse me, Madame la Baronne. Uh, what is it, Hortense? Uh, excuse me one moment, gentlemen. I cannot believe it. You may go. Yes, Madame. It is impossible. Is this true? Is what true, madame? That my horses have been removed from the stables. Is this true? Now be kind enough, madame, to listen to me. I... Oh, I shall listen most carefully. And these two gentlemen shall decide between us. Uh, uh... I insist. But first, I will state the case to them. Oh, madame. Yes. Gentlemen, <clears throat> among the horses in our stables are two which belong exclusively to me. The most Beautiful pair of dapple greys to be found in Paris. Ah, yes. Well, I had promised Madame de Villefort the loan of my carriage tomorrow to drive in the Bois de Boulogne. But now I hear that they are gone. No doubt my husband has sold them. Madame, the, the horses were too spirited for Nonsense. You, I... My coachman is said to be the best in Paris. My dear love, pray say no more on the subject. I promise you another pair, exactly like them, only quieter. Oh. On my word, Count, <laughs> I'm only sorry that I was not sooner aware of your arrival in Paris. I should have liked to make you an offer of those horses. They were far too lively for a lady's carriage. Well, I'm much obliged by your kind intentions towards me. Uh, but only this morning I purchased a very fine pair of carriage horses. Ah. And they've come, Monsieur Debray. You're an excellent judge of horses, I believe. Uh, uh, come across to the window. Give me your opinion. Uh, certainly, Count, I shall be honoured. But what do I see? Surely, Baroness, come and look. I cannot be mistaken. What is this? My double grace! How very singular. It was a little surprise prepared for me by my steward. If I remember rightly, he hinted that he had given 30,000 francs. 30,000? My dear, I... Oh, Baroness, I cannot endure the idea of making my debut in the Parisian world of fashion with the knowledge that my splendid equipage has been obtained at the price of a lovely woman's regret. Mm. Baron Danglars, please excuse the whimsical gift of a capricious millionaire and allow me to return the greys to your wife. No, oh, but... Uh, oh, no, sir, it is not possible. <laughs> to the capricious millionaire, all things are possible. Oh, madame, please, I insist. I would like you to be able to keep your promise to madame de Villefort tomorrow. Let her enjoy the ride in your carriage. Monsieur, your generosity overwhelms me. Yusuf, come here. Master. I'm going to ask more of you than I have the right to ask of a faithful servant. Ask, Master. I know that you are most skillful in throwing the lasso, but do you believe you could stop two runaway horses? Yes, Master. Then listen to me. Very soon a carriage will dash past this house, out of control, drawn by the grey horses you saw yesterday. Now, all has been arranged. At the risk of your own life, you must manage to stop those horses. You understand? I understand, Master. Good. Go and make your preparations. You must stop those horses. Yes. Yes, there's no great harm done. Madame is regaining consciousness. Yes. It yes. Now, just compose yourself, Madame de Villefort. All danger is over. But my child, Edouard. He's quite safe, I assure you. I've restored him with an elixir. Where am I? You are under the roof of one who esteems himself most fortunate to have been of some service. Oh. Oh, dear. My wretched curiosity has brought all this about. All Paris rings with the praises of Madame Danglas' horses. So I just had to try oh, them. Yes, yes, I understand they belong to her. They do indeed. Do you know her? Oh, I have that honour. I am the Count of Monte Cristo. Ah! I have heard so much of you from Madame Danglas that I feel I know you. I am Madame Louise de Villefort. Yes, Madame, I know. I am honoured. My dear Madame Danglars, 
I have just had a wonderful escape from the most imminent danger, and I owe my safety to the very Count of Monte Cristo we were talking about yesterday. You must know then that when I had proceeded with your horses as far as Ranelagh, they suddenly darted forward like mad things, and galloped away at so fearful a rate that there seemed no other prospect for myself or little Edouard but that of being dashed to pieces. When a strange-looking man, a Nubian, seized and stopped the infuriated animals, the Count then hastened to us and carried myself and my son into his house. When we were sufficiently recovered, the Count sent us home in his own carriage. I cannot return to you many thanks for the drive of yesterday, but after all, I ought not to blame you for the misconduct of your horses more especially as it procured for me an introduction to the Count. I have just made my husband promise to call upon him in order to acknowledge the service he has rendered our family. Yours truly, Eloise. Monsieur de Villefort, Excellency. Well, well, this is an unexpected pleasure. Thank you, Baptiste. Excellency. Sir, the signal service which you yesterday rendered to my wife and little son has made it a duty in me to offer you my thanks. Allow me, therefore, to discharge this duty and to express to you my gratitude. Monsieur, I am happy to have been the means of preserving a son to his mother. For they say that the sentiment of maternity is the most holy of all. Uh, yes, yes. I... yes. But come, let us walk together in my garden and discuss more general matters, for I am sure that we have much in common. You are very kind, monsieur. Bertuccio. Excellency, I'm so sorry. I had not realized that your visitor had already departed. No matter, Bertuccio. It was only proper that I, myself, should escort so distinguished a guest to his carriage. I kindly inform Baptistin that I am not at home to any visitor whatsoever. The rest of the day I shall spend with Mademoiselle Aidy. Very good, Excellency. Oh, one more thing. I shall require my carriage tomorrow afternoon, since I wish to call upon my, my newfound friends. Yes, Excellency. You are indeed most welcome, my dear Count. But what a pity my husband has gone to see the Chancellor and will not be back for some time. Oh, a great pity indeed. I had looked forward to continuing the most enjoyable conversation I had with him yesterday. Uh, forgive me, Madame de Villefort, but um, do you remember that we have met before? Uh, hmm? In Italy? Two years ago at Perusa? It is true that we were at Perusa two years it ago. It was in but... the garden of the hotel one very hot afternoon. Your daughter was walking while you remained under an arbour, and there you conversed with somebody for a considerable time. Oh, yes, I do remember. He was a medical man, I think. It was I. You? Yes. I had cured my valet of a fever, and so quite undeservedly acquired a reputation as a skilful physician. Ah. I remember um, we discussed the uses of certain poisons, did we not? Brucine and certain other preparations and elixirs? Yes, I remember now. Brucine. That is extracted from the Brucia ferruginea, is it not? Ah, such learning is rare among ladies. It is fortunate for us all that such substances can be prepared by chemists such as yourself, my dear Count. The elixir you gave my son, for example, on the day of that dreadful accident, recalled him to life instantly. Yes, one drop brought him back to life. Five or six would have destroyed him. Oh. Yes, it is a skillful preparation. It would be most useful to a person like myself, subject to fainting fits. Oh, well then, please, let me send you the recipe. Uh, but remember, a small dose is a remedy, a large one is a poison, and will inevitably kill. I say no more, madame. And now, if you will excuse me... Oh, but won't you stay to dinner? Oh, a thousand thanks. But I have promised to escort a Greek young lady of my acquaintance to the opera. Adieu, oh, then, sir. And... Please do not forget my recipe. Adieu, madame. Really, it is one of the absurdities of Parisian fashion never to appear at the opera until after the first act. It is ridiculous. Well, the house is filling up now. Ah, I see some friends of yours, Albert. The Dongla. <sighs> Why do you look away? Don't you see? They are trying to attract your attention. Oh, by heavens, look. There, in the Russian ambassador's box. It's Monte Cristo with the fair Greek. Oh, but she is magnificent. Magnificent. Madame Dongla is waving again. Oh, so I see. I'd better join them after the next act. Shh. It's beginning.
My dear Albert, you have come in the very nick of time. Oh, Lucia. Baroness Danglars is overwhelming me with questions about Monte Cristo, whose only merit in my eyes consists of being twice as rich as a nabob. <laughs> I'm sure no nabob of our time would have given me a pair of horses worth 30,000 francs, wearing in their headbands four diamonds valued at 5,000 each. Hey, he seems to have a mania for diamonds, Baroness Danglars. Perhaps he's discovered a mine. You know he has an order for unlimited credit upon my husband's bank. I did not know, but it does not surprise me. Have you noticed the extreme beauty of his young companion, Monsieur Lucien? Indeed, I have. Oh. Who is she? Does anyone know? Uh, the young lady is Greek, Eugenie. So I should presume by her dress. Is that the best you can do? I am sorry you find me so ignorant. I must try to persuade my husband to invite Monte Cristo to a dinner or something of the sort. Then he'd be compelled to invite us in return. What? Would you go to his house? Why not? My husband would accompany me. But you do know this mysterious Count is a bachelor. But the Greek girl with him, I thought... No, no, that, that is not his wife. He told me himself. She is his slave. Well, slave or not, she has all the airs and graces of a princess. She seems to me to be somewhat overloaded. She would look far better if she were to wear fewer jewels. What do you think of the Count, Mademoiselle Eugenie? He's so dreadfully pale. Some say that he is a vampire. Oh, what nonsense. Shall I tell you what you ought to do, Albert? Go and bring the Count here to our box. Whatever for? So that we might converse with him, of course. Have you no desire to be introduced to so singular a being? None, whatever. Oh, strange girl. Very well, madame. I will go at once to his box and endeavour to grant your wish. Dear Albert. Hi, Monsieur Albert. How nice to see you. I was just coming to find you, Count. Oh, upon my word, your Paris is a strange city. Do observe that cluster of persons around poor Yusuf. Really, one might suppose he was the only Nubian they'd ever seen. <laughs> as far as Yusuf is concerned, the only interest he excites is because he guards your box. You are, at the moment, the most celebrated person in Paris. <laughs> Who has filled your head with this nonsense? <laughs> Tell me, does your father, the Comte de Morcerf, never visit the opera? Father? Oh, he will be here soon. In the Donglas box, I believe. Oh, yes. And is the charming young female with Baroness Danglars her daughter? Yes, that is Eugenie. Ah, then I congratulate you. <laughs> we will discuss the matter at length some other time. Uh, by the way, the Baroness is simply dying to see you in her box, or rather to have you seen there by others. Well, then you may tell her that I shall pay my respects after the third act. Welcome, Count. I have been most anxious to see you again, so that I might thank you in person for saving the life of my dear friend, Madame de Villefort. Uh, it was not I, Madame, but my Nubian servant, Yusuf, who saved Madame de Villefort. Was it Yusuf who rescued my son, Albert, from the bandits in Rome, Monte Cristo? Uh, no, Monsieur le Comte de Morcerf. In this instance, I may fairly and freely accept your thanks. Uh -huh. But may I beg an introduction to your charming daughter? Eugenie, the Count of Monte Cristo. You have a charming young person with you tonight, monsieur. Your daughter, I presume? Uh, no, indeed. The um, person you refer to is a poor unfortunate Greek, left in my care. And what is her name? Adi. A Greek, do you say? Yes, you were at the court of Ali Tebel and the Pasha of Yanina, were you not, Count de Morcerf? Uh -huh. Did you ever see so beautiful a creature there? Did I hear correctly? You served at Yanina, monsieur le comte? Yes. I was Inspector General of the Pasha's troops. It was there I made my fortune. Ah! Hmm? Pray look, Count. Your box. Your ward seems suddenly taken ill, Monsieur. Yes, so it would seem. I will go to her at once. Uh, w with your permission, Baroness. Well, Adi, my dear, are you unwell? My lord, that man. Man? The man you spoke with a moment ago, in the box, over there. The Comte de Morcerf? What about him? Base, cowardly traitor that he is. It was he who sold my beloved parent to the Turks. And the fortune he boasts of was the price of his treachery. What? Yes, Lord. I will tell you everything. But let us leave here now. I feel as though it would kill me to remain any longer near that dreadful man. Very well. The opera is about to recommence. 
Let us go when the curtain is raised. My dear Albert, and you, Monsieur de Bray, I am honoured indeed. Count, I had hoped to see you again at the opera, but you left early. Oh, yes, yes, poor A.D. was overcome with the heat. I trust she has now recovered. Yes, quite, thank you, thank you. Uh, tell me, Albert, how are the plans for your marriage to Eugenie proceeding? Everything is settled, eh, Albert? Oh, well, <laughs> indeed. I did not expect the affair to be concluded so promptly. You must remember that my father and Baron Dongla our old friends. Mm. Mademoiselle Eugenie is very beautiful, is she not? Very, but of that style of beauty which I do not appreciate. Uh -huh. <laughs> I am an ungrateful fellow. Oh. You don't seem very interested in this proposed marriage. Oh, it's not all on my side. But, uh, you told me your father desired this marriage. My mother's is the dissenting voice. Ah. She seems to entertain some prejudice against the Dongla. Oh, that may be easily explained. Your mother, who is aristocracy and refinement itself, does not perhaps relish the idea of being allied by marriage with one of ignoble birth. <laughs> well, it will be a great disappointment to my father if I do not marry Eugenie. Marry her, then? Yes, but then if I do, I displease my mother. Ah, then don't marry her. Well, we shall see. <laughs> uh, but Monsieur de Bray, we're neglecting you. Mm -hmm. Are you making a sketch? Oh, no, I am engaged in arithmetic. I am calculating what the house of Danglars must have gained by the last rise in Haiti's stock. They rose from 209 to 409 in three days. Danglars must have made 300,000 francs. Oh, I had not realised that the baron is a gambler. It is not the baron who gambles, it is his wife. She is very daring, almost to the point of recklessness. But you are a reasonable being, Lucien. You know just how little reliance is to be placed on the sort of rumours which affect the stock market. True. Surely you can prevent your friend, the Baroness, from speculating? The Baroness does exactly what she pleases. Well, if I were in your place, I would teach her a lesson. Indeed? Yes. And how would you do that? Oh, Lucien's position as secretary to the minister renders him an authority on the subject of political news. Why, you never open your mouth without the stockbroker's hang on your every word, Lucien. <laughs> Cause her to have a heavy loss. That would teach her a lesson. I, I, I do not understand. It is simple. Uh, tell her some inverted piece of news, some telegraphic dispatch which you alone know and which could cause stocks to rise. <sighs> she will invest accordingly. Then, next day, when the newspapers deny the rumour, she will lose her money. It's simple. Uh, oh, good heavens, look at the time. I really must go. Oh, the minister. so soon? That is a pity. I will call again, if I may. Albert? Count? Monsieur. Adieu. Adieu. <laughs> well, now tell me truly, Albert, is your mother really against your marriage to Eugenie? So much so that the Baroness rarely comes to the house. Mm. Then let me speak freely. Baron Danglars is my banker. Monsieur de Villefort has overwhelmed me with kindness, so I had thought of inviting them and their wives to dinner at my country house at Auteuil. If I were to invite you, together with your parents, to this dinner, it would give it the air of a matrimonial rendezvous, in which case your mother would not be pleased with me. So I shall not invite you. Oh, but I now, would... Now, since Baron Danglars is certain to ask me why I did not invite you, please write just a few lines will do, and tell me that you have a previous engagement. I will do better than that. Now, your dinner is on... Uh, Saturday. Then I shall take my mother to the country for a few days. Oh, excellent. Yes, then I may entertain your father without offence. My mother and I will leave tomorrow for Treport. Ah. There, that is settled. Good. Oh, by the way, I have news of Franz Stepinet. Oh, yes, still amusing himself in Italy. Yes, I believe so. <laughs> yes, he's a charming young man. <laughs> he is, I think, the son of General Depinay. He is. Mm, the man who was so shamefully assassinated by the Bonapartists. That is so. Mm. 
Tell me, is it true that France is also engaged to marry? Yes, he is to marry Mademoiselle de Villefort. Indeed. Well, now all is arranged. If you will excuse me. Yes, adieu, Albert. Um, I, I shall see you when you return from Trépas. Adieu. Hmm. Excellency. Ah, yes, Bertuccio. I intend entertaining company on Saturday at Auteuil, and I shall require your services to see that everything is properly arranged. It's a beautiful house, or at all events it must be made so. And there is a great deal to be done before it may be called beautiful. The tapestries, for example, are very poor. Well, then let them be replaced. The, with the exception of the bedroom, which is hung with red damask. Leave that as it is. Yes, Excellency. Yes, uh, and do not touch the garden either. As to the courtyard, um, I should prefer that to be altered beyond all recognition. Yes. Yes, that will do, Bertuccio. Uh, excellent. Oh, uh, one more thing. I'm expecting two visitors. When they arrive, show one in here and the other into the blue drawing room. It shall be done, Excellency. Ah, my dear sir, you are most welcome. I was expecting you. Indeed. <laughs> you were aware of my visit, then? Oh, yes, I had been told that I should uh, see you today at seven o'clock. Uh, let me see now. You are Monsieur le Marquis Bartolomeo Cavalcanti. Um, yes, um, I, I am. Uh -huh. Ex-major in the Austrian service. <clears throat> uh, was I a major? Oh, yes. Very good. <laughs> yes. Your visit here is not of your own suggestion. You were sent to me by the Abbe Busoni. Exactly so. I have his letter. Ah, give it to me. <clears throat> oh, yes, I see. Major Cavalcanti is a worthy patrician of Lucca, possessing an income of half a million. I had no idea it was so much. Yes, half a million. And uh, only needs one thing more to make him happy, which is the recovery of a lost and adored son. A lost and adored son? Quite so. Stolen away in his infancy by gypsies. Right. Aged four years. Oh, unhappy father. I have given him renewed hope in the assurance that you have the power of restoring the son he has vainly sought these 18 years. Ah, the letter then was true. Uh, true. In order to save Major Cavalcanti the trouble of drawing on his banker, I sent him a draft for 2,000 francs to defray his expenses and credit upon you to the further sum of 48,000 francs. 48,000 francs? Of course. Oh. Now, you have doubtless brought all your papers with you. Papers? Well, yes. The certificate of your marriage with Olive Cosinari and the register of your son, Andrea's birth. Alas, I, um, I neglected to bring them with me. Yes, well, fortunately, the good Abbe Busoni thought for you. I have them here. Oh, capital. Take them. Study them. You will, I'm sure, take great care of them. Now, as to the mother of the young man, she has been dead these ten years. I am still mourning her loss. Yes, we are all mortal. But you must understand, my dear Cavalcanti, it is quite useless for you to tell people in France that you have been separated from your son all these years. Yeah, stories of gypsies who steal children are not at all in vogue in this part of the world. Um, you sent him to um, a college in one of the provinces, yes. And now you wish him to complete his education in Paris. No gypsies? No. Well, now, you have doubtless guessed uh, that I have a surprise for you. Hmm? You guessed he was here? Who was here? Why, your son, of course, Andrea. <laughs> I, I, I did guess it. Mm. My dear Major, I understand your feelings at this moment. Sit here quietly while I go and prepare the young man for this much-desired interview. <clears throat> yes, well? You know, I have only had uh, 2,000 francs from the good abbey. I... Ah, you want money. Yes, of course. <laughs> Yes. Uh, here are 8,000 francs in gold, oh. which means that I still owe you 40,000. 40,000? Uh, capital! Now, one thing more. Uh, those clothes are perfectly correct for the Via Reggio, I'm sure, but not for Paris. Not the fashionable. Exactly. And now, prepare yourself to meet your long-lost son. Andrea? Oh, yes. Um... 
The Count of Monte Cristo, I believe. Yes, sir. And I think I have the honor of addressing Prince Andrea Cavalcanti. Prince Andrea Cavalcanti. Yes, you have a letter of introduction addressed to me, I believe. It is signed Sinbad the Sailor, is it not? <laughs> exactly so. Count, I am at your service. Then perhaps you will be kind enough uh, to give me some account of yourself and your family. Uh, certainly. I am Prince Andrea Cavalcanti, son of Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti. Good. Our family, although still rich, has experienced many misfortunes. Mm -hmm. I myself was taken away from my dear father when I was only four years old. Uh, but, but no, no, not anymore. You were sent to a college in the provinces. Ah, I, I have not seen my father for 18 years. Yes, that's still true. I have been seeking him constantly, but all in vain. At length I received this letter from your friend which states that my father is here in Paris. Indeed. I have only just left him. Then he is here in this house? Oh, yes. You will find him a very presentable person. Ah, but... Uh... But it is so long since we were separated. Yes, he is a millionaire. Ah. Then I shall be placed in an agreeable position. One of the most agreeable possible. But uh, tell me, does my father intend to stay in Paris? A few days, no more. Well now, are you prepared to embrace your father? I ask for nothing more. Good. Then go into the next room. He is waiting for you. I will remain here. My dear father, is it really you? Andrea, my long lost son. At last we are reunited. Never again to part. Tell me, how much are they paying you to be my father? They are paying me 50,000. And I am to receive the same amount to be your son. <laughs> well, well, Major Cavalcante. Do you believe in fairy tales? I used not to do so, but now... See here. Hmm. <laughs> you think then that I may rely on the Count's promise? Oh, certainly. <laughs> but at the same time, remember we must continue to play our respective parts. I as a tender father and I as a dutiful son. <laughs> If that's what they wish. I hardly know. Now, those who wrote the letter, you received one, did you not? Uh, yes, um, from a certain Abbe Bussoni. Uh. Uh, here, read it. But I promise you will not betray oh, me. Rest assured, let me see. You are poor. Uh. A miserable old age awaits you. <laughs> would you like to become rich? Set out immediately for Paris and demand of the Count of Monte Cristo, Andrea Calvacanti, the son who was <laughs> taken from you at four years of age. You will find enclosed an order. Ah, I was right. It is almost the same, except that mine is assigned a scene by the sailor. <laughs> See here. Uh, uh, in, uh, you are poor and your future prospects are dark. <laughs> Do you wish for a name? Hmm? Should you like to be rich? Uh, go to the Count of Monte Cristo in Paris on the 26th of May at... Uh, at, uh, at uh, mm. ah. uh, uh, tell me, you have seen the Count, you say? Yes, uh, and he has uh, confirmed all the letters specified. Uh, do you understand it? No. Well, we must play the game to the end. I agree. <laughs> well, Major, are you pleased with your son? Ah, I am overwhelmed with delight. <laughs> Indeed, there is only one thing that grieves me. The necessity of leaving Paris so soon. Oh, my dear Cavalcanti, I trust you will not leave before I have had the honour of presenting you to some of my friends. I am at your service. But now, gentlemen... Good morning. And uh, when shall we have the honour of seeing you again? On Saturday, if you will. I'm to dine at my house at Auteuil. Uh, several people are invited, including Baron Danglars, your banker. Oh. <laughs> mm. I will introduce you to him. Uh, at what hour shall we come? Oh, about half past six. My man will give you all directions. Uh, we will be with you at that time. Good. Well, gentlemen. Ah. <sighs> There go two miscreants. It is a pity that they are not really related. Ugh. 
I sometimes think that disgust is even more sickening than hatred. Andrew Sachs was Edmond Dantes. Geoffrey Matthews was Baron Danglars. Steve Hodson was Le Comte de Morcerf. Nigel Anthony was de Villefort. And Melinda Walker was La Comtesse de Morcerf in The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Maximilian Morel was David Googe. Albert de Morcerf, Jonathan Taffler. Chateau Reno, Stuart Organ. Bertuccio, Stephen Thorne. Baroness Danglars, Margaret Wolfitt. Madame de Villefort, Sheila Grant. Baptistin, Kim Wall. Eugenie Danglars and Rosenfeld. A.D. Andrea Keeley. Major Cavalcanti, Tim Reynolds. Andrea Cavalcanti, David Goodland. And Lucien de Bray was Brian Hewlett. The Count of Monte Cristo is dramatized for radio in seven parts by Barry Campbell and directed by Graham Gold. 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 Gold.